going to take your Bibles, everyone, and turn with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. If you've been with us on Sunday nights, I've been preaching through, I preached through 1 Thessalonians, and then we were having so much fun, I just kept on going right on into 2 Thessalonians. And, but we're going to wrap that up tonight. We're going to uh, finish 2 Thessalonians tonight, and uh, then we'll be on to plowing new ground um, uh, next time. Uh, we're going to be in. Uh, we're going to begin with verse six, as Paul is wrapping up the letter to his second letter to the Thessalonian church. Um, he's going to kind of put the conclusion uh, of the letter uh, together and some final instructions to the church that are good instructions for us as well. Let's take a look. I'm in verse six of Second Thessalonians chapter three. Paul writes, but we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, <clears throat> that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we were not disorderly among you. Nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you, not because we do not have authority, but uh, to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Now, those who are such, we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. <clears throat> but as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. And if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him that he may be ashamed. Yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother." Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign in every epistle, so I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Coaches keys. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the privilege of being able to preach your word tonight, God. And I'm asking you to please speak to us. And give me the sermon that you want me to preach tonight, God, and the power to preach it. Please, God, don't let me say anything that you don't want me to, but I pray that I'd have the freedom and the power to say everything you do want me to. Teach us your truth tonight, Lord. Speak to us what we need to hear. And I pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Coaches Keys. So, I used to watch a lot of college football. I still like college football. I don't watch as much of it as I used to because I don't get ESPN anymore, but I, I used to watch ESPN all the time and watch college football, and I loved, like, co the coach, Lee Corso. And he was, he, was like the, he was probably, like, in his 70s or something, but he, he looked like he was 100. Uh, and he would always, you know, he would give his, his thoughts before the game, and they would always do these coaches' keys, coaches' three keys to victory, Coach Corso's three keys to victory. And he would, you know, break down, you know, here's what, you know, Michigan has to do to beat Ohio State. They've got to, uh, you know, stop the run, number one. Second, they have to be able to get the ball to their playmakers. And then they've got to eliminate uh, penalties and turnovers or whatever the keys might be. And then after the game or during the game, they would evaluate. You see here, Coach, uh, Coach uh, said they got to eliminate penalties and turnovers, and they've had four turnovers and 100 yards of penalties. So obviously they're losing. Of course, most teams would if they had those kind of stats. But, you know, I, I always loved hearing these three, like the whole game summed up in these three points. If they can just do these three things, they, they would, you know, they'd be a great team and they are probably going to win the game. Well, Coach P Paul, the Apostle Paul, kind of plays coach here in the, in the last part of, of chapter 3, the last part of, of the epistle to the Thessalonians and and he kind of gives us three keys of being a great church. And so uh, we're going to kind of 
play off that and we're going to see what Paul had to say to the Thessalonian church and we're going to see kind of uh, what it has to say to us as well. So we're going to look tonight at three attributes of a great church. The first thing Paul would say is this, a great church is an exemplary church. It's an exemplary church. They ought to be setting the example uh, that other churches could look to. And Paul said that he himself tried to live an exemplary life, that, that he tried to be an example not only to the Thessalonian church, uh, but to all the churches that he uh, was a part of and had a hand in starting or, or helping along the way. But it seems as though as we read these verses that a problem had arisen in the Thessalonian church. And the problem had to do with people in the church taking advantage of the church's generosity. You know, and that still can be a problem even today. You, you have to be a little bit discerning uh, because people will take advantage of church. Church is the most generous organization in our world. I'm convinced of that. Uh, and, and you guys are great, and if you think someone has a need, you're going to go... A, above and beyond to meet that need, which is what I think we ought to do. But the Thessalonian church had a problem uh, with freeloaders, if I can put it in those terms, and you know what I'm talking about. Um, they had people that didn't want to pull their own weight. They just wanted a free ride from the church. And you got to kind of understand how the early church was set up in those days. It was very much a sort of a communal lifestyle. Uh, everybody was is supposed to work and then they all took their money and they pooled it together very much like a family would and, and so like you did your job whatever you do and and Paul he made tents and he did his job and and somebody else did their job and and all the money goes into the kitty and then you use that money to meet the needs of the church whether it's food or whatever that might be now in theory, it's a great system, but it only will work if everybody's pulling their weight. And so what they had in the Thessalonian church was some people who didn't want to work, didn't want to contribute, but they just wanted to sit back and, like, eat, eat, I'll eat the church's meals. And, you know, the church was providing them, you know, the meals every day. I don't have a problem eating the church's meals, but as far as doing anything to contribute to the church... They, they weren't wanted no part of that. They, they, they were lazy, if we, can, if we can use that term. And so Paul's advice to the church is to exercise church discipline. Now that's something that you don't hardly hear anything about, that, that, that you would ex, actually uh, practice church discipline. Very, very few churches uh, ever practice church discipline. Uh, our, it's in our constitution there's provisions for it. I don't think it's probably ever been practiced here in an official way. Um, normally what happens is by the time these people are confronted uh, with their errant ways, they usually disfellowship themselves. You don't have to take official action of the church to disfellowship these people. They disfellowship themselves for the most part. But what Paul says is that you should break fellowship with these people who are freeloading on the church so that they would understand the wrongness of their ways and they would repent and be restored to fellowship. I don't ever, very few churches practice church fellowship. I was, I was in a church in Tennessee that had uh, disfellowshipped two individuals, two men back in World War II, like right after the war. They came home from the war and, I, and apparently these two men, church members, they got drunk and got in a fight. So the church just, they churched them. Is that, y'all understand what that, y'all use that term church. That's what, you know, I never understood what church, churching somebody meant. But that's what, when they say they churched them, that means they kicked them out of church. You know, and you can argue, did it, did it work or did it not? I, I don't really know. One of them I, ne I never knew anything about. But the other guy, he actually had started coming back to church while I was there. And so, but it was a long, hard road and, of, of repentance and, and restoration of the church. So, you know, I guess, you know, you have to kind of be the judge of that yourself as to how well it worked. But Paul said in this instant that in order to preserve the fellowship of the church uh, and the integrity of the church, that the church needs to practice discipline of 
of breaking fellowship with these people, not, not, uh, com- not indefinitely, but for a period of time so that they will understand what they're doing is wrong and repent and be restored to fellowship. Remember that the purpose in church discipline was always to, to restore to fellowship, not, not to break fellowship completely or finally, but to restore fellowship. Um, and the, and the, the discipline was to be carried out by the whole church. It only works if it's the whole church. So in other words, you can't take it upon yourself to say, well, I don't think what brother so-and-so is doing is very good, so I'm just not going to have fellowship with him anymore. That, that doesn't work. It has to be the whole church or else it doesn't work. Paul said the whole church has to, has to, has to be on board and agree that this is a serious enough offense that you're going to break fellowship for a time with this person. I think, the, I think a word of caution needs to be in there. I mean, you, you, we're all sinners. So just because you can't catch someone in, in a sin, you know, I caught Lisa Smith going 60 and a 55. I just think we need to break fellowship with her. I mean, it doesn't work like that. Uh, it's, it's something that's so egregious that it threatens the fellowship and the, and the integrity of the church body, which what Paul is talking about here in chapter 3 is just such a thing. I mean, if, if you have um, a church set up that we all trust one another, that we're all going to go out and we're all going to do our job and we're going to do our part and we're going to put all our money together so that we can meet all of our needs out of this pool and you come and you take out of the money but you don't put anything in, that breaks the trust of the whole fellowship. You know, there's a very similar thing with Ananias and Sapphira. You remember that story from Acts? And God just kills both of them dead. I mean, it was, a, and we look at that and we say, well, that's horrible, but it was something that threatened the very existence, the very uh, fellowship of the church. And so Paul, uh, so God took it very seriously and Paul takes it very seriously here. And Paul gives an example, himself is an example. He said, I tried to set an example while I was there with you. And, and what he says is that I worked while I was there. I held down a job and preached and ministered to you as well. And he's not making the point that preachers shouldn't get paid. In fact, he actually makes the opposite point. He said, I had every right, I had every authority to draw a salary uh, for my ministry. However, I chose not to exercise that right so that I wouldn't be a burden on the church and so that I wouldn't, uh, so that I could be an example to you that we should all work and pitch in and do our part. Uh, and so he said, I, I worked night and day. Kind of the picture is I preached all day and worked all night, or maybe he worked all day and preached all night. I, I don't know, but he, you know, night and day. In other words, he was pulling a double shift, one in a secular field and one in in the, in the ministry field, he was he was the, uh, the the maybe the first bivocational minister that we see here. But Paul said, "I you know I work because I wanted to set an example for you." And he's saying, "I want your church to to be exemplary, to set an example to everybody else." Paul loved this church. If you've been with us on Sunday nights, you see how he just gushed love and emotion and affection towards this church. He thought this church was great, but he, he also realized they had a problem that they needed to take care of. And so he said, I want you to fix this problem. Take care of it before it gets out of hand so that you can be an example, not just to your own congregation, but to other congregations as well. Uh, he, he took no salary because he, he wanted to be, and because he took no salary, he could be free from the criticism of greed. Um, he, you know, I guess even back then, uh, there, there was people who thought preachers were greedy. I don't know. And some preachers are. Not, not all preachers are. They're really not. But apparently Paul wanted to be, to be free from any, any label that might be hung on him that, oh, you're just, you're just in it for the money, Paul. Paul said, no, I worked just as hard as y'all did at a regular job and then went and preached as, as well. And he says... Here's the rule. 
He said, I, I gave you this rule when I was with you. If a man won't work, neither shall he eat. And we look at that and we say, man, that's pretty harsh. But realize, he, Paul isn't giving this as punishment. In other words, Paul isn't saying, well, if, if they're too lazy to work, then, then we'll just let them starve to death. That's, that's not his point. His point is, let's not as a church create a situation where there's no motivation for someone to get out and get a job and go to work. Able-bodied men that can go out and get a job and make a living, the church shouldn't support. Incidentally, they still shouldn't support. I mean, we get people all the time. They're usually not church members. They're usually people you know, off the highway coming in, you know, and they... They could hold down a job if they wanted to, but they, you know, they decided to make their living by going from church to church to church, just taking a handout. Well, you know, it, man, I tell you, when I first went in the ministry, I, I was very tender-hearted. You know, I just gotta help everybody. You know, and I took I took it to heart, man. Jesus said, if anybody asks you for anything, give it to them. You know, and I. And I did, and pretty soon I got to realizing, hey, the same person that asked me for money, you know, last month is asking for money again this month. You know, the last, the same person that wanted me to pay their light bill last month wants me to pay their light bill this month. And, and you know, and then you start to ask them, do you have a job? Oh, no, I don't have a job. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't. they always have a story. There's always a story that goes with it. And so the Lord over time has kind of taught me, you got to be a little bit discerning uh, with the Lord's money. I mean, you, you, you can't. You want to help people, but, but sometimes just doling out money to them isn't the most help, isn't what's best for them. So you kind of be, got to be a little bit wise. Paul is telling the church here, you got to be a little bit wise. If people don't want to work, then you need to make sure that they have ample incentive to do their part, to go to work. He's not saying don't help people if they're down on their luck. He's saying don't create a situation where... People have no incentive to work. You know, maybe our government could take a lesson from that, you know. Let's, let's don't create a situation where we're taking away incentives for people, able-bodied people to go out and get a job and make a living for themselves. Set an example as a church. Set an example as an individual, as a Christian. That's what Paul is saying here. You know, uh, it's interesting uh, what example we set. I know, and he was a little bit before my time, but, you, you know, if you're a baseball fan, the name Mickey Mantle will, uh, will certainly uh, ring a bell. Uh, great, uh, great baseball player for the, for the Yankees and, I mean, Hall of Famer and the whole nine yards, but he basically drank himself to death, um, die, dying of liver disease. And, you know, one of the last, uh, you know, one of, one of the last public, you know, statements that he made, and I think it was actually after uh, some liver surgery or whatever. He said, I'd like to say something to all the kids out there. He said, don't do it like me. He said, you want to see a hero? Then look at me and don't be like me. I thought, man, what a sad thing. Here, here, is, here is a man that every, every boy grows up dreaming, idolizing of of being like Mickey Mantle. I want to be like Mickey Mantle. And, and now you've got Mickey Mantle saying, hey, if you want to see a hero, then look at me and don't be like me. Paul said, hey, if you want to see how to do it, then look at me and be like me. Now that's, <laughs> that's pretty bold. That's not, you know, what is the old deal? It's not bragging if you can back it up. Paul wasn't bragging. He's just telling the church, man, I'd... I'd Work night and day to try to be an example to you. If you want to see, follow our example. We, the apostles, follow our example. I, you know, I I'm, I'm, don't feel like I'm nearly to the point where I could say, well, now, guys, now, if you want to see what to do and how, how to live your life, then look at old brother Mark and try to be just like me. Please don't, <laughs> don't do that. But I think each one of us should shoot to live an exemplary life where people would want to look at us, look at our life, and say, there's a man, there's a woman that walks with Jesus, and I want to be like him. I want to be like her. 
I, I want everybody that sees our church to be able to look at our church and say, now there's a church that loves Jesus and God is using them and God is working with them. I want our church to be like that church. That's what I want to shoot for. Paul says, if you want to be a great church, then you need to be an exemplary church. Secondly, he would say, a great church is an orderly church. There needs to be order in, in the church. Uh, and here again, he, he's going to deal with this. It's funny, it's, he saves it to the very end of the letter, but he's going to deal more specifically now with this, with this issue of people who aren't working, but they're causing trouble in the church. They're, they're, uh, they're, you know, you almost wish that they would go get a job where, so that they would have something to occupy their mind so they wouldn't sit around dreaming up ways to cause trouble in the church. That's kind of what Paul is saying here. And he says in verse 11, We hear there are some that walk among you in a disorderly manner. In other words, we hear that there's some of your church members who who aren't behaving themselves. And notice he says, we hear. In other words, the reports had come to Paul uh, that were indicating that this was a persistent problem. Paul felt it, a need to address it because apparently it wasn't a one-time incident. It wasn't that one time a church member caused some trouble. It was apparently there was a group of them that were consistently uh, problematic. Uh, he says, we hear that there are some among you that walk disorderly. Um, and that little verb, that phrase there, it, it, it means ongoing. So in other words, it, it, it's not a single occurrence that Paul is in reference to, but apparently a lifestyle. In other words, they, they've developed a lifestyle of being disorderly, of causing trouble, of causing disruption in the church uh, and not pulling their weight. And he, he, he lists three charges against these individuals. He says, first of all, they're leading an undisciplined life. Secondly, they're doing no work at all, which is, gets back to his original point about them kind of taking advantage of the church. And he says they're busybodies. Now, there's actually a, a Greek a word play. There's a word play in the Greek that our English really kind of misses, uh, but the best that we can try to get at that word play is something like this. They're not busy, but they're busy bodies. Now, that's not exactly how the Greek translates out, but in order to capture that word play, that, that's kind of the idea of it, that, that they're, they're not busy as far as working or doing anything productive, but instead they're busy bodies. They're, they're, they're minding everyone's business but their own. You ever known people like that? They don't, they, they're a part of everybody's business but their own, it seems like. Um, and so this was a problem because not only did it cause a drain on the resources of the church because they were eating the church's food and using the church's resource, but they weren't putting anything into the pot. But So not only was it a drain on resources, but it was a disruption in the church. So you, you, they're kind of causing two troubles. They're, they're a drain on resources, but they're, they're also kind of causing disruption in the church. And Paul lays down a, a, a basic principle. He says, if a man won't work, then don't let him eat. In other words, don't eat bread that you haven't earned. And I think there's a, there's a, good, <laughs> there's, there's a good principle for us all to live by. Don't, don't, don't have the idea that you're going to eat bread that you haven't earned. All those get-rich-quick schemes, I've tried them all out. None of them work. You don't even have to worry about them. I've tried them all out. They don't work. Get you a job, go to work, earn a living, and do your part, do your share. And that way when you sit down uh, in the evenings and you eat your beans and cornbread, you can feel good about knowing that I, I earned it. I worked for it. I, I, I did my part. Here's, here's what Paul is getting at, and I think it's something that we need to hear. Church does not exist to meet your needs. And I think there is a, a, there's a misunderstanding uh, by 
a good many people and a good many churches. And I've served as pastor of, of some of those churches. I, I don't really sense that to the, a great extent here, uh, thankfully. But, but I, I have served in churches where their idea is that the church is there to meet my needs. Please understand the clear teaching of the New Testament. You don't church, you, you join a church to serve, not to be served. Jesus said, not even I, the master, came to be, to, to, to be served. I came to serve. Uh, church doesn't exist to meet our needs. Church is a place where we come and we serve. Now, that's not to say that church won't meet our needs, but our goal should not be, what can I get out of church? But rather, what can I, what can I give? You know, what is the, the John F. Kennedy deal? Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. People aren't asking that question anymore, it seems. Now, it's bled over, that idea is bled over into the church where people still, uh, you know, churches now uh, have this idea of, well, I'm going to go and I'm going to get whatever I can. And it's dangerous because now it's, it's morphed into this, you know, whatever church can, can make me feel good, that's where I want to go. Whichever church can put on the best show, the best entertainment. And so I'm in it for what I can get out of it. And as long as I'm enjoying it, I'll be there. But guess what? As soon as it's not fun anymore, guess what? I'm going to the next circus down the road. Well, that's not church. That's, that's, that's a circus. It's not church, and it's certainly not the New Testament idea of the church. I, uh, so when I was in seminary, I had a job working at a bank. Uh, so I worked, I kind of did the Paul thing. I, I, I worked at the bank all day, drove an hour to Fort Worth, and then uh, went to school, uh, seminary, uh, from, from 6 to 9 at night. Got off at 9, drove home, uh, got home about 10, ate something, went to bed, got up at 8 o'clock, you know, got up, was at work by 8 o'clock the next morning, did the whole thing again, which was, I didn't mind. I was happy to do it because I was, I was serving the Lord. I thought that's what he wanted me to do. But one of the little old ladies at the, at the bank I worked at, you know, she was a little old church lady from the First Baptist Church of the town where, where we were, where the bank was, you know. And they were having problems with their pastor because he was doing doting on people the way they wanted him to. And, uh, you know, so she... You know, she would come and, you know, air her frustrations to me, which I don't know why people think that if you, you can put one preacher down to another preacher and they'll amen and think, oh, that's great. I can't believe he did that. It's been my experience. If you hate one preacher, you probably hate them all. So, I mean, you're not really helping your cause any by telling me how sorry your former preacher was. But anyway, there, you know, this little lady, she comes up to me and she says, I just want to know. What they're teaching, what what they're teaching you, what you believe, what is the role of the pastor in the church? Well, you know, she kind of catched me flat-footed. I mean, I didn't have really time to think about that. You know, I mean, people that ask you deep questions like that, and then you know, on the spot, what you know, so you just kind of say what comes to mind. So I thought for a minute, I said, well, I guess I would say that the role of the pastor in the church is to preach and teach the word of God. She said, wrong. I said, what? She said, you're wrong. I said, I am. What is it? She said, the role of the pastor in the church is to meet the needs of the people. Learn that, and then you can be our pastor. And boy, she wheeled around on her, on her heels and walked back to her office. And as she's walking away, I'm thinking, lady, I don't think I want to be your pastor. But I thought a lot about that because, I mean, I thought, man, did I, am I wrong? Am I this? You know, I thought a lot about that. And I, I, I really would like someone, if they can, to show me where in the Bible it says the role of the pastor is to meet the needs of the people. Because I've read the New Testament several times. I ain't never read that. I read where, John te- uh, where, where Jesus in John gospel tells Peter, feed my sheep. But feeding sheep is different than meeting the needs. Feeding sheep is different than meeting all the needs of the sheep because 
what they mean by that, what those people that say that, what they mean by that is give me, dote on me and give me whatever I want. Okay, I've raised sheep before. And I know for a fact, if you give a sheep everything he wants, you're going to end up with a mighty pitiful sheep. Meet the needs, yes. But that doesn't mean, that doesn't translate into you get whatever you want. But we've created this idea in churches that church exists to meet my needs, to make me feel good, to serve me. But that's not what the New Testament idea of church is. The church, that New Testament idea of the church is we come together and we serve the Lord. And yes, we serve others and sometimes we serve each other. But that's not our goal. And, and if someone is taking advantage of that, it, then, then they need, it needs to be stopped. And that's what Paul is saying here. And how he says to do that is to identify them and then break fellowship with the offender. That just uh, not, <clears throat> not have anything to do with them for a period of time. And so really Paul instructs them to kind of practice what we would call shunning them. In other words, just, just, just don't associate with them. Don't have anything to do with them. And the purpose, and, and this, you've got to understand this, the purpose was not to punish them. In other words, it's all in your attitude. It's not, well, I just can't believe that they would do that. I'll show them. I'll just shun them. It's not that. It's, it's out of love. He says, not like an enemy. Don't treat them like an enemy. Treat them like a brother. If you saw your brother or your family member making a mistake, stepping out of God's will, wouldn't you in love go to that person and say, hey, man, what's going on? I know, I know that this, you know, there's something you know, not right. We need to fix it. Okay, that's what you're, you're doing uh, in, in this where they're supposed to realize, oh man, I, I really have been taking advantage of the church. That's not right. Uh, and so that they would repent and then be restored. The, the goal was always the restoration of fellowship, never the full and final breaking of fellowship, but restoring that fellowship. So a church, there, there has to be order in, in in the church. If it's going to be uh, a great church, it needs to be an orderly church. And then finally, Paul would say, a great church should be a godly church. Now this is, I guess, should go without saying, but Paul here in his final blessing kind of highlights some of those ideas. He ends the letter by signing it in his own hand. He says, in my own hand, I'm signing uh, this, this letter. Why did he do that? Well, Paul probably used a, a secretary, a scribe that wrote the letter. Uh, there's, there seems to be some evidence in his letters that he's, his eyesight is, is failing him. And so he probably dictated the letter to someone. But for authenticity purposes, he at the end, he takes the pen and he signs the name himself. This last line, he's writing himself so that it will be in his own handwriting so everyone can look and say, okay, this really did come from Paul. Because it would have been easy to forge a letter uh, from an apostle and you've got instant credibility. If you could forge a, 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 a letter from Paul, you, you could make it say whatever you wanted to and then you have apostolic authority behind it. So Paul is signing it. He says, I do this with all my letters so that it would be clear that this actually did come from him. And notice what he says in verse 16. May the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. Don't you think it's interesting that Paul, who had just got through talking to the church about practicing church discipline, now is praying for peace. And you say, well, now, Paul, that seems sort of counterintuitive. In one verse, you're talking about breaking fellowship with somebody. and the next verse, you're talking about praying for peace. And Paul would say, yes, sometimes the only way you can have peace is to deal with problems. And I think that's, there's, a, there's a, a lesson in churches, in the lesson for churches in that as well. Um, you know, as a young man and a young pastor, uh, I had this idea that keep the peace. And if problems come up, then don't rock the boat and keep the peace and, uh, and ignore a problem long enough, and maybe eventually it'll go away. And you know what I found over time? Little problems that are ignored don't usually go away. 
You know what happens to little problems that are ignored? They usually grow into be big problems. And, and Paul, Paul is saying, look, I want you to have peace. I want you to be a peaceful church. But the only way you can be a peaceful church is to deal with the problems. Go ahead and deal with it. Get it over with. Uh, rip the band-aid off. Deal with it. And, and let, let the man see he, he's in the wrong and repent or the group of people or whoever it is and repent, and so we can be back in fellowship and have peace uh, with one another. Uh, problems usually don't go away on their own. And, and sometimes the only way to keep the peace is to fight the battle. It's bad. Oh, and I, I hate uh, church conflict is the worst. I, I mean, I, I would rather take a beating as to have to deal with church conflict. Uh, but sometimes the only way that you can have peace in your church is to go ahead and fight the battle and get it over with so we can move past it and, and get on with being the church that God has called us to be. There's a, a line in uh, one of the Lord of the Rings movies. I don't know if you've seen those or not. I think it's in the second one, the, the Two Towers, where Aragorn is talking to King Theoden about, uh, about sending out troops to help uh, in the war effort. And because because the attack is coming, evil is coming. Evil is marching on uh, on the on the, the the side, you know, marching after the the good people, marching to take the kingdom. And King Theoden says, "I will not risk open war." And this classic line from Aragorn, where he says, "War, open war is upon you." whether you would risk it or not. And I think sometimes in churches, we have this idea is I don't want to do anything because we hate, we love peace and, and we hate church conflict and, and we, we ought to do that. I mean, that's the way we're supposed to be. And I think there's this idea sometimes that I don't want to do anything that would risk open war in the church. But you know, the reality is sometimes we reach a point where we say, okay, war is upon us, whether we would risk it or not. And it's time for the people of God to stand up and do the right thing. And praise God, may I say, this, is, this has been my experience, my four and a half years, this has been a church where they have demonstrated a willingness to do that. That when something needed to be addressed, they addressed it. And I'm convinced that the reason that we are as peaceful of a church today as we are is because they had the guts to stand up to people who were doing wrong and say, this is wrong, you cannot do it here anymore. And that takes guts. But they did it, and now we have peace. The Lord, then he, and then he says this, the Lord be with you. The presence of the Lord is essential for a church to thrive. We, we cannot do it without the Lord. So he prays for peace and he prays for the presence of the Lord. And you know, a, a lot of people write, talk about church growth and a lot of people writing books about how to grow a church and this and that and on and on and on. Well, I have my own, I have, I have developed my own theory about that. And I haven't written any books about it or anything like that, but I think I'm pretty close to right. I, I, have, I have seen enough that I am become convinced <clears throat> that if a church will preach Jesus and get along with one another, they'll grow. Because there just aren't that many churches out there doing that. If you look around, shop around, you're not going to find very many churches anymore. Maybe they never were. I don't know. But certainly in our day. How many churches within driving distance, or you could count them on one hand probably, that you would say they preach Jesus every Sunday and they love one another and they get along with one another. And it's peaceful there. There just aren't that many. And if you can do that, people will come because they want to be a part of a church like that. So that's what Paul is saying. Look, be, be, a, uh, be the kind of church that, uh, <clears throat> that God is going to bless, that God is going to be present in. 
uh, one who is uh, preaching Jesus and one who is um, at peace with the Lord and peace with one another. And then he says, the grace of the Lord be with you. Uh, that's how he ends it. Uh, grace. It, it, Paul seems to, un it's interesting that as he deals with this unpleasant subject of some church discipline that needs to take place, that he ends by saying grace to all of you. Trying to remind everyone there and us as well that, that he who is a recipient of grace uh, must also be willing to give grace. And so we, we have to always remember that, uh, that, we, that God has dealt with uh, to us, uh, to, toward us in grace, and we have to extend grace to others. You cannot, it, you cannot function on grace from God towards you and then expect everyone else to function by keeping the law towards you. In other words, you cannot expect God to judge you on a basis of grace and you judge everyone else based on the law. It doesn't work that way. So, keys to the victory. What are the keys? Be, a, be an exemplary church. Be an orderly church. Be a godly church. This is what Coach Paul's keys to victory would be. We have to ask ourselves, how well are we doing with what God has given us? Now, I'm kind of reminded of a a story that the old comedian Jerry Clower uh, told about his old alma mater, Mississippi State, was playing Texas Tech in a football game one Saturday afternoon, and he said they were just getting beat terrible. It was like 50-something to nothing Tech was beating Mississippi State, and he said, he said and I guess Jerry played for him, uh, for, uh, played for Mississippi State at a time or whatever. Anyway, he said he got to watch, and, and he said that they had three footballs. And he said they were, uh, the quarterback was handing one to the tailback. He was throwing one to the tight end, and he was keeping one and running around the end with it. He said, I went to the referee. I told him, I said, ref, that's not fair. They've got three footballs. Quarterback is throw, pitching one to the tailback. He's throwing one to the tight end, and he's keeping one and running around the end. He said, I just don't think that's very fair. Ref, if you're going to give them three footballs, you ought to give us three. He said the referee was kind of a smart aleck. He said, you're not doing too good with the one you got. So, I, you know, I, I mean, maybe before we ask the Lord for more, we ought to ask ourselves what we're doing with what he's already given us. He's given us all we need to be a great church, to be an exemplary and an orderly and a godly church. But here's what I've, here's what I've realized. Great churches are made up of great Christians. It's built one Christian at a time. And we each have to look at our own self. We can't look around across the pew and look at somebody else and say, well, I, don't, I think they could be doing a better job. We have to look at our own self and say, am I being all that I can be? Am I being exemplary? Am I being orderly? Am I being godly? What are you doing with what's been given to you? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you again tonight, Lord, and I just uh, thank you again for this, for this chapter in 2 Thessalonians. I thank you, Lord, for um, our, our time of study and preaching through First and 2 Thessalonians, Lord, and how you blessed me uh, from it. And, and, and I just pray now as we come to this time of invitation and decision, Lord, that you would just touch our hearts and speak to us, Lord, uh, see if there are decisions that we need to make and lead us to make those decisions. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.